Today we're going to be talking about how we can socialize kittens, especially right now during this time with everything odd going on. And just to give you a little more information about myself, my name is Kristen Vitale. I um, received my master's of environmental science from Miami University in Ohio. So I'm from Ohio originally, just like Tabitha. I came out to Oregon about five and a half years ago and got my PhD in animal science, where my, most of my work has to do with cat social cognition and looking at how different life experiences impact the cat's behavior. Um, I also traveled to Japan and did cross-cultural research looking at how that cat-human bond may differ between the U.S. and Japan. And I'm also the creator and co-host of Cat Side Podcast along with Tori Peterson. So if you're not familiar with us, definitely check us out. We're on YouTube as Cat Side Podcast. Um, but from kind of the structure of this talk is I'm going to hand it over to Tabitha and she'll introduce herself. She'll talk for a little bit, I'll talk for a little bit, and then we'll kind of come back together and have time for questions. So from here, I'll go ahead and hand it off to Tabitha. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, so like Kristen said, we're doing this lecture together, super fun from different time zones. So I realized when I said eight o'clock, uh, it's five o'clock for Kristen. So whatever time it is for you guys, thanks for joining us. My name is Tabitha Crucera. I am a registered veterinary technician, a certified cat behavior consultant, and a Karen, Pryor cert bleh, a Karen Pryor Academy certified training partner. I am the owner of Chirps and Chatter Cat and Dog Behavior Consulting and Training. And I am also elite, fear-free, and low-stress handling certified, which are certifications shelter and veterinary professionals can get. And it's all about addressing animals' emotional well-being as well as their physical well-being because vet visits can be scary. There's a lot we can do to make it less scary for them. I'm also a cat positive trainer mentor for the Jackson Galaxy Project Cat Positive. Cat Positive is just an organization where we work with shelters and we teach them all about feline body language and clicker training, and also how to help solve behavior issues and get these kitties adopted as soon as possible and keeping them in their homes. And then I'm also the co-chair of Pet Professional Guild's Cat Committee and the board member of the Together Initiative for Ohio Community Cats, because of course, we love our community cats too. And you can find me on the social medias at Chirps and Chatter, but I'm gonna get started. So first things first, why is socialization so important? I think we all know this, especially, I'm sure there's a lot of people joining us who work in rescue or foster. And unfortunately, behavior issues in cats often result in them being relinquished to shelters. In many cases, doors just opening. Um, so the client or caregiver has frustrations with their cat. They don't understand that cats can learn and have their issues resolved or don't understand that the underlying cause is a medical issue. And due to frustration, they just open their door. Most of us are like, where did you get your cats? They came to you, um, which is a problem. Nope, that's not great. Um, we want people to seek their cats. We don't want tons of people leaving their cats when they move or just opening their doors. Um, and also, of course, we don't want cats to be euthanized for behavioral issues that in many cases could have been prevented or if the caregiver had the right tools to start, they could at least get help from someone like myself um, to get the cat on the right track. So when it comes to socialization, cats are more likely to find lifelong loving homes. So I work with rescues as well as veterinary clinics as from a consulting standpoint. And I worked with rescues my whole life. Um, and I think we're really great at spay and neuter, which is awesome. We're really, really great at getting animals adopted. Now it's time to focus, because we're always improving and learning, which is why all you amazing people are here. Now it's time to focus on how can we keep them in their lifelong loving homes? Because from a consultant technician standpoint, I see a lot of cats get adopted and within three months, the door is opening. Um, so now it's time to really focus on how can we set adopters up for success? How can we set caregivers up for success? because that way those cats are not going, we're not gonna see them at a year or when they're an adolescent when we tend to see more behaviors that are frustrating to clients 
they're going to stay in their homes. Um, again, fewer cats will be unnecessarily euthanized at shelters. No one wants to do that, but not every shelter has the behavior capacity to handle these issues. So we want to do what we can to set these cats up for success to handle changes. Like if their parents go on vacation, they don't start house soiling um, because that's a big change for a cat and that can be a trigger to cause that. And if a cat starts peeing, guys, that's the number one reason cats are either euthanized or relinquished to the shelter. And in so many cases, as a behavior consultant, I can attest to this, house soiling is preventable. <laughs> so also fewer cats will be relinquished to shelters. So again, socialization is important because we want cats to be adopted. We want their caregivers to love them. We want that human animal bond to be strong. So now I'm gonna get all into what is socialization. And I'm using my little slide and Kristen's moving the slides for me as an amazing person. So what is socialization? It's basically a process in which appropriate social behaviors are developed. So the cats learn what behaviors are okay and what are not by our standards and theirs, because we have to respect them as cats. And they also learn that humans aren't terrifying things. Um, we all know feral cats, those are truly unsocialized cats, which is why you probably don't see a lot of feral cats. They tend not to be out when you're around, or if you do feed them, they eat and run. Um, so socialization is basically the process of us teaching cats appropriate social behaviors and setting them up for success in the real world. So well-socialized cats will learn that new people, items and objects are not scary. And that means there's no need to hide or be scared or become stressed. And behavior issues are, in many cases, caused, in some cases, medical as well. But in a lot of cases, it is caused by stress or fear, um, like aggression. Cats don't just attack for no reason. That's not a thing. Um, usually, they do it because they're fearful. As a vet tech, a cat's fearful of me. They might begin to scratch me. Ideally, I would stop before they get to that point. Um, but it's really important to help teach these cats new things are fun. New things aren't terrifying. You don't have to like run and hide under the bed as soon as a new person comes in. Even though hiding is a natural coping mechanism for kitties, cats naturally are actually fairly inquisitive. They're curious, that's the true thing. They wanna check things out. So when new things happen and your cats are running, we wanna allow them to hide, but that also tells us they most likely didn't have the adequate socialization when they were younger. They also learn that good behaviors earn rewards. So. We click or train cats, both me and Kristen do kitten kindergarten classes, and we teach them sit, stay, a recall, so to come to you, also appropriate play, and a lot of other really important things. What, how to scratch what we want them to scratch, because they need to scratch, but I understand why you don't want them scratching your couch. Um, so we talk, we talk about all of that stuff with kitten socialization and kitten kindergarten. So from the owner's perspective, the kitten is being introduced to a variety of stimuli, so that they learn that the things they will encounter in their life are safe. And it's really important when it comes to introducing this different stimuli, it should be 100% positive, which can be difficult, um, but it should be 100% positive and a pleasant experience for the kitten. And from the kitten's perspective, it's really the process of learning behavior and social skills needed to thrive and live. Just, if I wasn't socialized, I would be very weird right now. <laughs> I would be cowering, I'd be conflicted, um, I'd be like, this is a computer, I don't know what's going on. If people have never seen someone with blue hair or tattoos, they might be conflicted by me because they were never socialized to people that look like me. Um, and some people are more sheltered than others, but those affect people for the rest of the, their lives, and this is the same things with our kittens. I love this saying. So socialization is a lot more than exposure. Um, I see a lot of people do this with puppies as well. It is important to expose the kitten to a variety of stimuli, but it's a lot more than exposure. People usually think of socialization as exposure. Instead, we should really be thinking of it as concepts to train and life skills. So socialization is your kitten making proactive decisions in their environment to provide reinforcement or consequences that they like and that we like. So it's not necessarily teaching them to tolerate. You could say Tabitha tolerated that hug. Um, I didn't like that hug. That was unpleasant for me. I'm not a big fan of that. They tolerate it. That means they don't really like it and they're probably doing it against their will. Um, and that's 
conflicting. We want them to be comfortable and we want to teach them to make good choices. So these photos, for example, because a lot of kitten socialization is body language, which we're not going to have time to get into today. Um, but these are two examples of kittens who were exposed to stimuli and it was too much um, because this, th these are not pleasant experiences. So this first kitten is simulating this human. He has a whale eye, so you can see the pupils of his eye. The eyes are very wide. He's cowering away like this kitten. This kit kitten actually has piloerection along the tail and the back. Something fell and startled this kitten. So that's the context of the photo. Um, but context is important. And thankfully, this kitten recovered quickly. The technician tossed some treats because she didn't mean for something to fall. Um, and the kitten recovered quickly. But that's because we're socializing that cat and setting that cat up for success. This kitten below is frozen in fear. So I see a lot of people who would pick this kitten up and hold this kitten. Um, this kitten feels like these people do. They're really tense. You can see it. They're breathing very deep. They're like me on a plane. It's fun. Um, they're breathing very deep. They're conflicted. They're looking away. This kitten, is, his whiskers are down. He's frozen. He's all limbs are as close as possible. Both of these kittens are, are really afraid. So it's really important not to just teach them to tolerate. Like, could these kittens tolerate things? Yes. But they're fearful. So it's really about exposure, but also keeping it positive for the kittens. So the goals of socialization are for the kitten to approach you and others without fear. So they solicit attention. You don't go to them and then pet them. They choose to solicit attention and ask for it by, we've all had that your cat rub into your arm or your, or your hand and say, pet me, because that's them giving us consent. They tell us yes or no. It's just, they don't speak English. So a lot of times people miss that. Um, but it's really important for the kittens to be able to approach others without fear for the kittens to seek attention from people by approaching them. We train behaviors like targeting, which is their nose touching a target, which is a really helpful foundation behavior that Kristen's gonna get into later. We also teach them to sit, how to walk on a harness. Our cats go on walks and enjoy it, and yours can too, and that's what we teach in kitten kindergarten. We teach them to happily accept a harness. We teach them to go, we go on field trips, not right now, but, um, Pre-pandemic, we would go on field trips together. We also teach the kittens to associate potential fearful situations. So what I mean by that is things that I commonly see cats are terrified of. So car rides, nail trims, restraints, and vet visits. We work on all of those things when they're younger prior to them having trauma, and we just associate them with good things. And then handling is easier for them to handle and even like as they age, which is awesome. And vet techs love that too, of course. And then last but not least, we really want to boost confidence and broaden life experiences. Because again, if this kitten was just in a shelter or in a bedroom and didn't really have any exposure to anything, understandably that kitten, it's going to be harder to handle change, to handle moves, anything. Um, and then ideally we were going to reduce fear. So those are our goals of socialization. Now, when it comes to cat socialization, key period, it's a little rough um, because it's a lot shorter than dogs. It's about from two to eight weeks, and many of us don't have kittens at that age, but a lot of rescues and fosters do. So this is something that can be really helpful to create a program for your shelter about kitten socialization and train all your fosters because, oh my gosh, you guys have these kittens when they're that young and you can really set them up for success. We do kitten kindergarten up to 14 weeks because of course the kittens are still learning, but we call it a key socialization period because during this period, kittens have no fear. So they're bonding with their siblings, with their parents. They might have something startle them, but they recover really easily. So new environmental novel things just feel safe. Everything's safe. It's great. Um, thankfully, they don't, they can't stay like that forever because if everything was safe, they would go into cars. They would run towards the dog that is lunging and barking at them. So fear, unfortunately, is a part of life, um, but we still want to set them up for success. So after this period of two to eight weeks, their default setting becomes fear when new things are exposed to them. So we can definitely utilize these tools that we're going to talk about in cats who are eight to 14 weeks or 
me and Kristen have done this in adult cats as well, but that two to eight week period, there's no trauma generally most, in most cases. You can just positively associate experiences and it's a lot easier to do since these kittens have no fear. Um, so that's kind of why you may see a kitten kindergarten class and there's an age frame. That key socialization period is really important. So now development and learning, how cats learn. There's some fun big words in here, um, but it's really important to understand how cats learn to socialize them or even work with them. So we're gonna just talk a little bit about how cats learn. So non-associative learning is a change in the strength of response to a stimulus due to the repeated exposure to that stimulus. What that means is they are basically making associations with all the stimuli around that, or not making associations, they're basically, I'm trying to think of the way to word this. Habituation and sensitization are simple forms of non-associative learning. So what that means is the animal's just learning to either ignore or attend closely to a stimulus. So habituation is similar to if I've always lived in a city, um, I like it, it's very loud. I worked at a farm sanctuary for a short period of time and lived in Watkins Glen. I did not like it. <laughs> um, so. But most people would, if they lived in Watkins Glen and moved to a city, they would habituate to those sounds that they're hearing or the ticking of a clock or the wearing of a watch. So basically there's a reduction in a response to the stimulus through repeated exposure. So the cat kind of gets used to it. Now the important part is habituation only works if there's no negative or positive effects. Because again, if I'm just hearing some sounds outside for the first week or two, it might be harder for me to sleep if I'm from a rural area, but I'm probably gonna sleep just fine. If I hear a sound and then someone throws a baseball into my window, now we have some consequences that might affect that. So an example of this would be a kitten wearing a collar, just how a person habituates to wearing a watch. So you place it on them and they just kind of get, get used to it because it what you didn't throw it on them, it easily went on. They ju it's just like a kitten wearing a harness when, when we train it. They just get used to it early on. And then sensitization occurs when repeated exposure to a stimulus increases the intensity of a response. So we can't really control what cats are feeling. So two cats exposed to the same trigger may have completely different reactions based on their learning history, their socialization, their age, all of these things affect behavior. So we can't always say whether or not, I know cats who are afraid of a lot of things, just like humans who are afraid of a lot of things that I'm not afraid of. So sensitization is basically when that repeated exposure to a stimulus increases the intensity of a response. So that stimuli becomes more scary. So a thunderstorm, for example, we see a lot of dogs with storm phobias, but I see cats with storm phobias as well. Um, shell shock is a good example from a human standpoint, the reaction to exploding shells only increases. Another really good example would be, let's say you're with your brother and if you have a brother and he pokes you and you say, please don't, he pokes you again, you say, stop it. He pokes you again, you say, mom, he's poking me. And then you scream, stop it. And then he pokes you again and you punch him. Um, that stimulus, which is a single poke, remained unchanged in intensity. My brother didn't poke me harder. He poked me the same amount, but because it was repeated, it caused a stronger and stronger response in the learner, which was me, and now I'm sensitized to poking. So next time when my brother just goes like this, I'm going to get upset. <laughs> um, and this is the same thing with thunderstorms. Your cat might be fearful of a thunderstorm and then they start to sensitize it to I know when it rains, it's going to thunderstorm. So it's really important. These cats are making associations and learning all the time, um, but it's not as simple as they'll get used to it because they'll only get used to it if there's no negative or positive consequences. And we can't always control all those things in the environment. So classical conditioning, oh, my cat's eating squeeze cheese. Um, this is how all, animals learn. So they learn through association. It occurs in life every day. The fun thing is every time we're interacting with an animal, we're teaching them. They're making associations. This is the same thing with your children. 
it's really easy to negatively associate something accidentally. So it, it's really important to pair stimuli or novel things and experiences with good things. And we're, we're going to create positive associations from the start, which is why kitten socialization is so great. Because again, these cats, these are all new experiences to them. And if we keep it positive and pair good, it with good things, right away, we're creating positive associations from the start. So a few examples, these are all examples of cats I've worked with. The first one, the cat is, the kitten is at the veterinarian and we're using food to lure the cat out of the carrier. So we're associating the vet with good things. This is my cat, Malt. Um, I could counter condition and desensitize her, which I'm gonna get into, to nail trims, or when I first got her, she was actually an adult, but I started right away to pair nail trims with good things. I didn't know she'd take the whole, the whole can in this video, but it was really cute. So um, I just cut her nails while she eats cheese. She loves it. She sits on her dad. It takes me five seconds because I started pairing it with, young, with, with fun things when she was younger. And then also these two kittens on the bottom are in my kitten kindergarten class. This kitten on the, in the black is laying on his back. So we're actually teaching the mom how to teach the cat how to happily accept being on his back so she could cut his nails by herself. And you see, I use syringes to feed the cat's treats in my classes because I want them to love syringes and I want them to be fun. So then if medications do need to happen at some point in time, which let's be honest, they probably will. Syringes are fun. Fun things come out of syringes. Um, and then the, these two kittens are kind of exploring new things. So this is a new novel environment for them. I'm watching their body language and I'm pairing it with treats. So these are all just simple things where I pair it with good things that that cat likes and it makes it better for them. So classical conditioning, again, we all have different associations with various stimuli. So do our animals. We all love our cats because they're individuals, but we often hear things like, but my other cat, or I've had cats for 20 years and they've never done this. We need to remember that cats are individuals. I look at this cookie and from classical conditioning, I am already having feelings. I think of my grandma, I literally smell the cookies, I feel warm and cozy, but if you ate a bunch of chocolate chip cookies and had food poisoning, you're going to have a different association with that chocolate chip cookie. This is, is a dentist's office. I love dentists, but I'm not gonna lie, I have a fear of them. And just by looking at this photo, my heart rate went up and I'm actually feeling a bit tense. Um, so those are just two examples of classical conditioning. You guys feel things when you see things. Remember that your cats have different associations and you can't know what all of those are. So what happens if there's a negative association? Because we see this in kittens too. And of course we see this a lot in our older cats. The kitten had some, something that was either accidentally a negative association or we had to get the medication. So we kind of traditionally restrained the cat and it wasn't a great experience for them. There's things we can do. The things we don't wanna do is something called flooding. So flooding just means exposing an animal to a stimulus that triggers fear. So it's something that they're afraid of and we just put them right in front of it for a prolonged amount of time because we're like, they'll get used to it. I'm gonna put them in front of what they're afraid of full force and they'll get better. The thing is they won't. Um, so you see the spiders on this, slide and hopefully none of you are afraid of spiders because I know it's a common fear. But if you were afraid of spiders and I was like, go in this room with spiders, not only are you still going to be afraid of spiders, but that fear may even generalize to other things. Like for example, you may see a black speck of dust and think it's a spider and feel that same fight or flight response that you do when you see a spider. So flooding, Force, like for example, you have a kitten and you want them to get along with adult cats. I'm gonna hold the kitten tight. I'm not gonna assess their body language. I'm not gonna watch or let them go or escape. And I'm gonna put them up to the adult cat. That's what we would call flooding. They're terrified and can't get away. And that's going to increase fear and stress a lot. And none of us want that. So that's what we want to avoid if there's a negative association. If the cat's scared, we're not gonna just be like, suck it up go in front of it. Just like it doesn't work for us, it definitely doesn't work for our kittens. And there could be a lot of 
actual side effects that makes their fear even stronger or more generalized. What we do want to do is something called desensitization. And that's the gradual exposure to a situation or stimuli. So instead of being like, here's spider, go in that room, you're afraid of spiders, go in that room, I'm closing the door, suck it up, which I would never do. Um, we're gonna start at a non-stressful point and gradually increase. So for example, I'm gonna look at my learner, which is why body language is so important. Or if I was working with a human, I would say, are you comfortable with a real spider? Some people might not be. And we would start with maybe a stuffed spider, basically a non-stressful point where their heart rate is normal, their blood pressure isn't escalated, they're not showing me a bunch of signs of stress. And I'm going to have that stuffed spider at a distance far away enough where again, it's not stressful for that person. And then we're slowly gonna move that human closer and closer to that spider by pairing it and also pairing it with good stuff, which is all about classical counter conditioning. And that just means we're changing the pet's emotional response. So classical conditioning, you're learning through association. Um, I saw that cookie, I got food poisoning, cookies suck. Um, classical counter conditioning means we're going to take that negative response and we're gonna make it, a, make it a positive. So we're changing the pet's emotional response, feelings or attitude toward a stimulus. And we need to remember that emotions are involuntary. So fear um, and usually fear is a really great example. That is involuntary. Like if someone popped out right now, it would actually scare me. Um, if someone popped out from my chair and went boo and I screamed, I cannot control that. It's, it's instinctual. So when it comes to classical counter conditioning, we're changing that emotional response. And I commonly hear if I address, like if I pet my, my sad dog or my fearful dog, I hear it a lot more with dogs. Um, if I, give a treat for my, this cat attacked this other cat and I tossed a treat to redirect the cat. Aren't I reinforcing him doing that? You're not. Um, because if that cat hissed, he was fearful, it was involuntary. And by you redirecting that other cat, that other cat's getting reinforced for disengaging from that cat. So I always hear things like you can reinforce fear. You cannot um, because it's involuntary and it's an emotional response. So I just wanted to mention that too. So classical counter conditioning and desensitization put together. So if you were to have, if your kitten was to have a negative association or your cat, and I'll talk about this video in just a minute, we're going to use both of these tools because desensitization on its own can work, but it's going to be a lot slower. Um, so usually as a behavior consultant, we use classical counter conditioning and desensitization together. So we're going to change associations from negative to positive, which take time and is based on that individual kitten. I can't tell you, your kitten's going to love the like restraint in two weeks. Um, they may with, with working with me, but again, that's not something you can guarantee. We kind of have to go at the kitten's pace. So when it comes to classical counter conditioning and desensitization, Usually you need a professional because this is a more advanced behavior modification, but I just wanted to touch on it. You're, you're gonna make a plan. So again, that gradual desensitization, I'm not throwing you in front of the spider. We're gonna start at a place where you're comfortable. So I'm gonna find out where's, first off, what are these cats triggers? Like this kitten in this, this video, he was not, he did not like being touched or petted. So we were working up towards him being pet because he was being fostered through an amazing rescue and she did a wonderful job, but she was struggling with getting him to happily accept pets and he would run and flee from people. And we all know people want cats that solicit attention and allow them to pet them, not that run away from them. And she wanted the best for him. So I made a plan. I started at a place where he was comfortable. I set up my environment for success. Uh, what that means is, for example, this cat on the ground showed more fear. So I set up, before I even started the session, I'm like, let's grab a table. I wonder if he'd feel better higher. And he did, because he showed less anxiety when he was a little higher up from me. So I had a plan in my head of where we're gonna start. We're gonna start, I was going to start at one, placing my hand over his head like this. And then I was gonna, the next step would be one pet, then two pets, then three pets. Um, so again, I'm going to casually work up to that. You see, I'm already doing three pets and this was my first session, but I started lower because if I would have went seven pets, I went too fast and now we ended on a negative note. 
I'm going to choose reinforcers that the cat likes because you may think your cat likes something, but they may not. Um, and I know Kristen's going to go into that. And then again, I'm going to go at a pace the kitten's comfortable with and stay below threshold. Or what I mean by that is I'm going to stay below the point where the cat should only be exhibiting zero to minimal signs of stress. I always like to say threshold as an example. Like if I was to come home, I worked all day, I'm frustrated, I, I've had a horrible day, I hit every red light, I spilled my coffee, I get home and my, I start yelling to my husband, not at him, and he tells me to calm down. He's coming from a good place, but I'm over threshold. So I can't think or focus because I'm so stressed out and I may say some things to him that aren't very nice. And then 30 minutes later when I've eaten, I'm a vet tech, we're bad at eating. Uh, when I've eaten and taken a breath, I'm like, I'm sorry, I, I was over threshold. <laughs> I can think and focus now. Um, so that's if, if you see your cats fighting or your kitten being really fearful at a vet, they're not being difficult. They can't think or focus because that, that's what happens. So this video, I present the food and then I pet the cat three times. So I'll show that. Present the food. The cat starts eating. One, two, three. Remove my hand. Remove the food. And you see he backs up, but then he chooses to stay there. So I felt comfortable doing it one more time. And then we continue to work up to that cat being comfortable. If he would have backed up even more, I would have been like, I'm going to do one pet next time. Or if he would have walked away, I would have been like, I'm going to... Lower, lower my criteria or what I want, and I'm gonna only pet him once. And then here's just one more example of, this is an adult fearful, feral cat um, that one of my lovely clients adopted. And we work together, this is a process over time to get him comfortable with her in the room, with her in the room, with her moving, with her touching him, and now he's soliciting attention from her. Like in this video, it, it's a progress. So this took two to three weeks. So these things take time. Um, and sometimes that's pretty quickly for something like this because this poor cat was fairly unsocialized. So he's staying in front of her and he's rubbing. That was the first time she ever saw him do that. And we all know in rescue, that's, oh, that's why we do this for a living. <laughs> and then in the next video, He actually approaches her. You could forward it a bit, Kristen. And he is now like, lead. this cat was terrified and would hide in a corner and would not come out when this owner first contacted me. And she was amazing. We created a counter conditioning and desensitization plan, which took time and we broke it down into the steps. The client did amazing. And now this cat doesn't only solicit attention, but comes out as soon as she comes in and won't doesn't want her to stop petting him. So classical, classical counter conditioning and desensitization can do really amazing things. I'm gonna let Kristen take it from here. So, oh, forgot I had a screen cover on there. <laughs> So <laughs> great. Yeah. Thank you, Tabitha. That was really great. And I'm going to kind of talk about um, some similar things. So hopefully it'll kind of all mesh together. But I love that video Tabitha just showed. It, when you work with unsocialized cats, it's just so amazing to see that progress. And when they're finally approaching and like rubbing like that, it just melts your heart. So I love it. Um, but uh, I wanted to start just by talking about a little of the science into socialization. So what are actually the benefits to doing this? Well, one of the first studies to look at this was done in the 60s. And what they did was take three groups of kittens and gave them different levels of experience. So some of the kittens, they actually had handled by several different people. They were played with and they had a different person for five days um, out of the week for four weeks straight. In the second condition, they had the same treatment where somebody handled and played with the kittens, but this time only one single person did it every time. 
And then in the third group, it was just the control. So nothing outside of normal happened for these kittens. And what they wanted to see was basically what's their fear level with people after undergoing these varying levels of socialization. And they found that um, basically the kittens that were socialized by more people showed less fear of them. So kittens that had five different people socializing them made less escape attempts and retreated from people significantly less. Now, um, that's not to say that the one person group didn't have any benefit. They did have some. Um, those kittens tended to play more. Um, so there, there's still benefit to socializing them, even if you're the only person in the house with them. But if possible, it is good to um, have that early handling by several different people in order to help reduce the fear of people overall. So what are the other benefits? Well, um, we can also look at the length of handling. So can you just you know, socialize a kitten for a few minutes a day and will that have a lasting impact? And um, what they did was have varying levels. Um, so either the kittens were socialized for 40 minutes a day or for 15 minutes a day. And basically what you would think that the 40 minute a day kittens were um, more amicable to handling and they also approached people more frequently. And um, they, they kind of found that over that, so like an hour or so of socialization didn't really make much difference. It kind of plateaued after that 40 minute mark. But that in general, if you're gonna be socializing, try to spend at least 40, 45 minutes with them um, to really help them develop that friendly response towards people. So until now, we, we have really been focusing on young kittens or some of these um, unsocialized uh, adult cats, but we don't only have to think of socialization just for kittens. It could also be for older kittens as well. So um, as Tabitha talked about, that two to eight week old um, period of time is, is really important for the kittens. And that's why you see a lot of these kitten kindergarten classes aimed at that age range. But as part of my PhD, we wanted to see, well, what about the older kittens? Um, most people don't even adopt a cat or a kitten until they're above that eight week mark. So does you know taking your new kitten to these kitten training and socialization classes as an older kitten impact their behavior or does it have any positive impact? So that's what we were looking at for kittens three to eight months old. So above that sensitive period age range. And so we um, had 100 kittens and 50 of them went through this six week kitten training and socialization class. And 50 of them were our control kittens and nothing out of the normal happened. And we found that the kittens that went through our class had increased task persistence. So what this means is that compared to the control kittens, the kittens that had been through the class were more likely to complete cognitive tests in our lab. So they would be more likely to approach the people and keep participating in training. Um, we also found those kittens that went through the class had a more rapid sensitivity to their owner's behavior. So the control kittens, they're not really having a typical response that we see adult uh, cats having. Um, they're still not really adjusting their behavior in response to, an, uh, to their owner or to a stranger. But for the kittens that went through the class, they are adjusting their behavior in response to their owner's attentional state. So whether their owner pays attention or ignores them. So in general, we are seeing that even for older kittens, socialization and training can have lasting and important impacts on their cognitive abilities. So I wanted to show um, an example of what these, oh, let me turn off this music. So I can talk over it here. Um, but I wanted to show what these classes look like. So um, again, we, like Tabitha talked about, we want to broaden their life experience. So a lot of the time with cats, the only time they're leaving the home is maybe to go to boarding if their owner is going on vacation or to go to the veterinarian. So often these cats don't really have a positive response to leaving because they know that something negative might happen. And so some of these classes is just trying to break down that, um, trying to show them 
that when you leave the home, positive things can happen. You get to play and you get treats. Um, so in addition to the socialization between cats and with uh, new people, so other owners, you can see we also train different behaviors. So Tabitha mentioned targeting. That's what we're doing here. We also teach uh, sit, go to mat and stay, um, trick behaviors. And a lot of it is also just giving the owners the tools that they can then take home and use with their cats. And you do see a lot of food being used in these videos, but we didn't always use food with them. So some cats are motivated by different things, as Tabitha mentioned. So some of these cats were actually more motivated just by social interaction. So good job praising and petting and then maybe following up with a treat or two. Um, but that's something you want to consider with your own cat. What is it that they like that they want um, as a reward? And I'll talk about in one second how we can figure that out. And the final thing they did for these courses was just to train a trick behavior. So you'll see that um, here as the last thing. So we had people do things like high jump, um, jumping through a hoop, ringing a bell. So there were a lot of different behaviors. But here you can see um, all of these cats are outside of their sensitive period and they're still learning and still um, having a positive experience. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how we can then use some of these principles of learning to help bond with our cats and help socialize them. And um, I'm not gonna get too in depth into the actual learning principles because we could do a whole talk on this. But um, when we're talking about positive and negative reinforcement or punishment, we're basically talking about, okay, are we giving the animal something or taking it away? Say you have a child who is really good and you give them dessert or they're really bad and you take away their dessert. Well, that's referring to positive and negative. So you add something, you give them something that's positive or you remove something that's negative. Um, now the impact of removing or giving them something, um, we look at how that impacts their behavior. So if we see that their behavior decreases, that's punishment. If we see their behavior increases, that's reinforcement. So um, there, there's multiple things we could talk about here, but we're just gonna focus on positive reinforcement for now, because often that's giving the animal something appetitive, something the animal wants, a reward, in order to increase a behavior that we want to see. So that's what we're gonna be focusing on. Before we can start training, however, um, we need rewards that are actually rewarding to the cat. And as Tabitha talked about, if you're using something that the cat doesn't like, then it's not really serving that function. So um, you can really consider the individual, that every cat is going to be different. And you can mix up the kinds of rewards you're giving them. So let me just go ahead and show you this. Um, at Oregon State, we did preference assessments with cats. And we did what's called a free operant assessment, which just means we give the cat a free option to choose what type of items they want to interact with. And then we measure preference for those items based on how long they spend interacting. So if you know um, your cat loves one kind of food, but that's it, then you might wanna try something like this with them and just see what are some different rewards you can help switch in and out of. So um, try playing with them and then try petting them and see which condition do they spend the most time with you under. Um, do they spend the most time playing with a toy that's a feather toy or a mouse shaker toy? Um, do they spend the most time eating chicken or tuna? So this is a way you can measure what your cat really likes just by observing their behavior. And um, the results of our study um, are shown here, and this is for adult cats, not kittens. But what you can see is that the majority of the cats most preferred social interaction, and that was followed closely by food. So 50% most preferred the human interaction, 37% most preferred food. But this is really interesting because if you think about training, we're often just using food treats as rewards. But there's a huge chunk of cats that maybe food is not their most preferred thing. 
and social interaction or toys or even a scent object might be more preferred for them. So that's why it's, it, it's important to consider your cat as an individual, but also in order to prevent habituation like Tabitha was talking about, we don't want the cat you know, getting used to um, the same toy over and over. They're gonna get bored of it. So we wanna keep it fresh and we wanna keep it something that they want. So um, we can also do things uh, called gentling exercises if we're trying to socialize your um, kitten. So again, it, it's really key if you have a young kitten, two to eight weeks old, do some of these gentling exercises with them. Now that doesn't mean if you have an older kitten or an adult kitten, this still isn't important, but definitely for younger kittens, you wanna do this kind of thing. And um, the whole idea here is just to get them used to the idea that human touch isn't threatening, it's not dangerous, it's actually something that could be rewarding. So you can pet the kitten using different styles of petting, you can massage them, you can stroke them, um, you can use different kinds of brushes, Basically, the idea is just to broaden their life experience by giving them um, different, different things to experience. Um, you can also try touching their paws, extending the claws. That might help um, if they ever need their nails trimmed later on, getting them used to that very early. Um, you could even rub around their, uh, their lips. And that way, when they have to go to the vet and get their you know, teeth checked, it's something that they've experienced before. But the whole idea here is that you wanna do this gently and slowly. So you don't wanna just, as Tabitha said, flood the kitten with all the stuff, pick the kitten up, hold them against you, rub them, check their teeth, check their nails. You wanna do little bits at a time. And the whole idea is that you want it to be positive for them. Um, last thing I wanted to mention about this that a lot of people in our kitten classes, I would notice they would be playing with their kittens with their hands, but you really want to be careful with that because then you're basically teaching the cat that the hand is a play toy. And especially when the kitten gets older, then you're going to have to break that association. And then when they're an adult, it's going to be really hard. So start off by showing them a hand is, it's something to rub on, it's something to smell, but it's not something to play with. So um, I also wanted to talk about some of these different training tips for socialization. So um, one of the easiest ways of training a behavior is just capturing. So the whole idea here is that you're not gonna force your cat to do anything you're basically just going to catch the moments when they do do it. So basically your cat's freely offering behaviors and you can reward for the ones that you like. So here, I'll show you an example. Um, this is before my cat Bo was an inside cat. So he actually just showed up at our door and um, you can kind of see he's got a bite wound on his neck. Um, I had to take him to the vet and get him all treated. And then of course he, weaseled his way into our home. So this was before he was a house cat. Um, but you can see I'm just rewarding him for sitting. Turn this down, oops, one second. So again, I'm not forcing him to sit. I'm just um, clicking. If you're using a clicker, click reward. If you just have rewards, just reward when they sit. But I'm just capturing it. I'm not forcing him. And then once the behavior, um, you've been uh, rewarding it several times, then you can put it on a cue. So um, say I've rewarded sits like Every day for the past week, the animal seems to be understanding that when they sit, they look at me for a reward. So now that they understand the behavior, I'm going to slowly add in a cue. So at first, you're going to start by presenting the cue at the same time the animal does the behavior. So what you'll see is Bo will sit and I'll say sit at the same time. And then I slightly move it up as I see him about to sit and then slightly move it up a little more. And you'll see eventually it's moved up so much I can just ask him to sit. So I won't talk during this, I'll just let you pay attention to what's happening.
So you can see Bo's transformation from an outdoor kitty to indoor, and now he's got sit on cue, and it all happened just by giving him rewards every time he sat. So another thing we can do is called luring. And so this is again, um, taking that reward that you've already determined and um, using it to guide their behavior. So again, I'll just go ahead and show this video and explain what's going on. Now jump over the stool, it's just kind of a fun thing to teach, but the whole idea is I'm going to use that reward to guide their behavior. So if you have an individual who um, maybe doesn't listen to you and you pick it up and you take it to the other room, well maybe instead you can take their reward and lead them into the other room to make it a little less invasive. But you can see I've got his reward and I'm just moving it, guiding how I want him to move over the stool. And then as soon as he does it, um, you can see that rub there, that's showing Bo's love in his training session. But yeah, the whole idea, if you have your reward, you can kind of guide the cat or the kitten to do the behavior that you want them to do. Again, Bo loves rubbing, he loves training. He often will come up to me asking for training, so he definitely is my trick cat. Um, targeting, we've already talked about this a little bit, so I'll just go ahead and play it. But the idea here is that whenever they touch the end of a stick or just an object, it doesn't have to be a stick, um, they get a reward. You can even put like baby food or um, pate, cat pate on the end of the stick to kind of get them interested and then have them lick it off. I've got another kind of uh, uh, target stick here, but the whole idea is put it in front of them, have them touch it, then give them a reward. And the great thing is that once that's trained up, you can then use it again to guide their behavior. Um, so now I can have her stand or I could lead her into her carrier instead of picking her up and placing her there. Here's another example of targeting from our kitten training class. It's really hard to see, but they're actually using a chopstick with um, pate on the end. So it's guiding the cat across the room in its harness and leash and letting her lick off the food from the chopstick. And again, it's just giving them a little more control um, because anything with operant conditioning is the animal's choice. The animal has to choose to engage in the behavior. So we're not forcing them to do this. Here's another example of targeting. Um, and I loved that they did this because they're actually using their target to walk one cat across the arena to another cat. And these two cats have never met before. This was actually really early on in this class. But you can see they're not picking up the cat and taking it over there. They guide her to a certain point and then they stop, which I really appreciated. They stopped at that point and then let them decide if they wanted to socialize. And you will see that they choose to approach each other and they sniff each other. And um, this was actually the very first time they met. So this was a really positive interaction for them. But again, just some tools to get you thinking about how you can guide your cat's behavior um, instead of forcing them to do some of these things. Okay, so um, now that we have some of these training tools, I want to talk about how we could get our cats used to um, the harness and leash, either to go outside or um, in case you need to take them somewhere like the vet, um, and they are a little more confident and uh, you don't need to worry about putting them in a crate or carrier. But the whole idea, um, people often kind of want to rush this stuff. They get really excited that they have the harness and they just want to put it on the cat and be ready to go. But um, you, you don't want to do that because, again, it might be a negative experience for them and then they're going to always associate that with it being something bad. So before you ever even put that harness on them, you want to associate it with good things. And this is just a good train of thought for anything when you're introducing it to a cat. Associate it with good things and slowly work up to it. So um, before I'm putting that harness on my cat, I'm putting it somewhere where the kitten spends time. 
and putting it by their bed or on their cat tower and um, allowing them to explore it on their own. And it also allows them to put their scent on it so they can rub on it or they can smell it. And again, that helps them. Um, it's not going to smell so much like a factory or wherever the harness came from. It's going to smell more like them. If the cat's not really interested in exploring it, you can put treats and catnip on it um, to get them smelling it and associating it with good things. Whenever you're putting it on and off them, really give a lot of praise. I sound kind of silly in some of my training videos because I'm like, good job, good boy. Um, but it's because I want them to know they are doing a good job and they are being a good boy. Um, so that's really positive as well. Cats can read both human mood and emotion and behave sensitively to that. So you always want to watch your own behavior as well. Um, but what I suggest is kind of another thing Tabitha was talking about, which is this idea of shaping. So at first, we're not just going to put the harness on for an hour and expect that to be a good experience for the cat. We're going to slowly build up to that. So at first, we might just put on the harness for one minute, then two minutes, then five minutes, then eight minutes. And eventually um, the cat's going to be really comfortable and you won't need to worry about slowly shaping it up every time. But by doing that, you're ensuring that they're getting used to it and that also they're going to end it on a positive note. They end it knowing, hey, this harness wasn't so bad. Um, once the harness is on them, you can get them moving in it by playing with them or having them do their targeting. But um, you really want to get them used to the harness before you try taking them outside anywhere. Now, once you have them um, used to their harness, you can then use that incremental shaping to build up to how long they can be outside. So again, first trip outside, don't make it an hour or even a half hour. I know all of us um, with the lockdown and quarantine are ready to get outside and maybe ready to get outside with our cats. But remember that it's still novel to them and just one minute outside, end on a good note, bring them back, and then tomorrow do two minutes and then do five minutes, then you know slowly work up to a half hour or something. But don't just do that right off the bat. And again, it's not just about exposure to the outside, it's about allowing them to see that being outside is something fun and rewarding. Again, you can use your lure or your target to get them walking, but one thing to consider is that not all cats are going to want to walk. Um, some cats just find it more rewarding just to sit in the sun and hang out. And when you think of cats as ambush hunters, they are spending a large proportion of the day just hanging out. So it's really pretty typical for a cat to want to do that. So don't get upset or frustrated if your cat doesn't want to go on a walk with you. Um, they're probably getting just as much enrichment out of just sitting out there um, than they would if they were walking. So really uh, consider that as well. And then also getting your cat outside can help with socialization, especially right now because we might not be able to have people over at our homes to help socialize the kittens while we have them. But taking them outside safely in harness and leash allows them to then watch the neighbor kids or watch the people walking by from a distance and to really watch the behavior, be able to smell them, but without having any kind of close interaction. But the whole idea, go slow with your kitten and always give plenty of praise. And if you see the animal getting frustrated, you know it's time to end the session. Um, so just a little overview, but again, use things your animal likes, keep those sessions brief at first and then work up to longer sessions. This idea of jackpots is that if you were giving one treat every time they sat, well, when you end the session, give them five treats. Let them know that they did a really good job so that sticks in their mind and they know, hey, these training sessions are fun and I get good things for doing them. Um, so the whole idea of ending on a positive note is really important. And then one thing that I have started doing, well, I've done for a while, is video recording myself with um, the animals during these training and socialization sessions. And even watching some of these videos I showed tonight, I'm thinking, oh, I would not give a treat that big now. Like one of those chunks of chicken I gave Bo for that video is like huge. I would have given like a quarter of that now. Um, 
but I learned that from going back and watching like, okay, I need to change my behavior. Or you can also see the animal's behavior that um, if you're socializing kittens and all of a sudden the kitten's tail becomes all twitchy, their ears go down, their eyes are dilated, and maybe you missed it during the socialization session, but having it on film and going back and rewatching can help you become better at reading the body language and knowing, okay, it's time to end the session now before they get too worked up. Another thing to consider while you're in lockdown is exposure to novel items. And you might not think you have any novel items in your home, but you probably do. And um, I've told this story before, but my husband and I were gonna go to the ocean um, probably six months ago or something now. And we got out our cooler, just put it in the living room. And when we came back into the room, the boys were already in the cooler, smelling, jumping in and out. So um, again, that's just broadening their life experience, showing them, hey, what's this? What's that? And allowing them to learn about it. It also keeps it interesting for them, especially if you have an indoor only cat or kitten um, and their environment never changes. Having new things in the environment can prevent habituation. It can prevent them from that response waning over time and keep it novel and interesting. You can also do um, exposure to novel substrates and textures. So these are not my photos. All credit for these goes to one of our kitten class participants, Sarah, and her cats, Max and Franklin. But um, she is a vet, a uh, vet student, and um, was bringing her cats in for um, the water treadmill exercise. And water treadmills are really great for cats that maybe have hip or joint issues or maybe trying to lose weight. Um, because being in the water helps take stress off those joints. But you can see before she even let the cats be in the water, they were allowed to examine the treadmill and then they were gently um, exposed to the water. Now I'm not saying you need to do anything like this with your cats, but the whole idea that you should expose them to water, um, they should maybe know what water is and that if they have to get a little water on them, it's not the end of the world. Even if we never plan on bathing our cats, sometimes um, they get sick, that has to happen, they get sick in the carrier. Um, so you don't want them, their first time ever being exposed to water to be the time that they're sick and covered in poop or something. Um, so exposing them to different surfaces, different material, materials, different litters, all that stuff is really important. And then novel experiences. So we've already talked a little bit about getting your cat outside, even if that just means sitting on the grass. Um, and if you're, you're having more time at home uh, due to lockdown and have some extra chicken wire, you can consider building something like we built for our cats. So um, this is just a cat enclosure. We've got a little, um, uh, not sure what to call it, a little spot where they can go in and out from the window and then go into the actual enclosure and then several levels to it. So this was just built with chicken wire, boards, and some zip ties. And it was actually meant to be um, temporary, but it's been standing for about five years now and five different cats have all used it and we keep adding to it. But definitely something to consider if you have the time and you're kind of a DIY person, especially if you have a new kitten. This again allows them to be socialized to the outdoors while being safely contained. Okay, so um, I'm actually going to hand it back to Tabitha to just talk a little bit more about socialization in the home, especially with everything that's going on right now. So Kristen had some wonderful things that you guys can start doing with your kittens and all the amazing fosters out there can start doing. And here's some other things. So socialization at home, it's really important to change your body and face. It sounds weird to say, but change up your appearance because even if there wasn't a pandemic, exposing your cats to hundreds of different types of people is probably going to be unlikely. So something we can control is you can change up your appearance. You can wear different outfits, hats, glasses, costumes, uh, pair it with good things. Or for example, right now, my cats are already trained. They're older cats, but I've just been wearing a mask while we train. 
to kind of, because masks are a normal thing now. And a lot of animals don't know what the heck those things are, understandably, and are pretty fearful of them. So here's a photo of a kitten kind of investigating the mask, which is awesome, checking it out on their own accord. And the person's going to reinforce that. You can carry different types of bags is a huge thing. If you have tote bags, book bags, plastic bags, those are things you guys have around in your house. And hey, I'm gonna take a day today. I'm gonna wear a fun costume to take the mail out, live my best life. And your, your cat will be like, oh, cool. This is probably nothing. But if you do notice any unsureness, conflict, you could pair it again, just throw some treats as you put that mask on. Change up your gait. So I have crutches in my house because unfortunately I have broken ankles before. Um, but I also, in my kitten kindergarten classes, I have wheelchairs and crutches and canes and a variety of different things because these are things that your kitten most likely is going to be exposed to. And someone walking with a limp is a lot different than someone not walking with a limp or running or um, in a wheelchair. So all of that, we're going to just show them those novel, ex ex novel things. We're going to broaden their horizons. We're going to pair it with good stuff. And they're going to be like, this is awesome. Everything's great. Um, also wear masks, medical masks, costume masks. I have a lot of masks because Halloween is my favorite. So I have a lot of fun masks for my clients and caregivers to wear in kitten kindergarten. Um, this is a picture of my husband. I love him, but he is terrifying. Uh, he has a beard, he wears glasses, and he has a hat on. And a lot of people are like, this animal doesn't like men. But realistically, it may be that animal is never socialized to taller, like people over six foot. So whether it was a female or a male or beards, again, if you've never seen a beard in your entire life and when you're 70, you see a beard, you're going to be conflicted about it. Um, so wear fake beards, have fun with it. Anyone with kids right now, oh my gosh, you guys can have so much fun. Just make sure the kids aren't running and screaming while they wear the mask because I know that's hard. Um, they, they get to stay still. Pick a mask for today. You toss treats to the cat while you stand like a tree. It could be a really fun kids game because I know all you parents rocking out this pandemic right now. So changing your body and face is a, is a great way to help socialize your cats to lots of different types of people. Another thing you can do is sounds. We all know sounds are, are a big part of everyday life. And some of the sounds your cats may not have a fear of, they may become habituated to those sounds. Like for example, a microwave beeping um, or my cell phone ringing. But I have worked with cats who are afraid of cell phones ringing. Um, and that's where sensitization happens. Maybe something fell when that cell phone was ringing and they're like, this is really too intense. So some things that we could do is, of course, have reinforcers the kitten loves. You could have a wand toy, long lasting treats. So a long lasting treat could be a Kong or I really like licky mats, which are just flat mats with different textures. And that's also a really cool socialization thing because they're eating off different textures. And you, oh, perfect. Oh, Kristen is on it. Yes. <laughs> and you could, or if you don't have a licky mat, just get some whipped cream, a small amount, or squeeze cheese or churro and spread it really thin on the plate. You're gonna put it down. You're gonna start the sound. So there's like a soundproof puppy app. Most of the things are made for dogs, but we use them for cats too, because they learn the same. Um, or you can just go to Apple Music and literally look up truck, dog barking, baby crying. Um, I can't tell you how important the baby crying thing is because I deal with a lot of clients who are going to have a baby and then they contact me after the baby is born because the cat is having some pretty severe behavior issues. And in many cases, it's because not only are my parents acting different, my parents are probably more irritable because they're over threshold more, but what is this baby? Uh, it's different smells, it's the, he or she is moving, they are crying. So what you can do is play a sound at a, a low rate. So basically start at a place where your kitten isn't showing any signs of stress, present, present the licky mat, start the sound low, and then slowly increase the sound over time. And what you're doing is you're socializing at home to a variety of different sounds. You could pick three to five sounds a week for your kitten. And some things, for example, if you're going to vacuum, 
we're going to start with the vacuum down and then I might have the vacuum on on an app and then I'll connect the two because the two together might be too much. So really working on these dog barking, trucks moving, thunderstorms, those are kind of some of the common ones I think of, but there's so many sounds we could do. Clippers are a huge one from a veterinary standpoint. There's a lot of great apps for clippers. So start getting your kittens used to a lot of different sounds. And then course appropriate play. I can go on and on about this. Um, Kristen already mentioned that hands and feet aren't toys. And even though those kitten bellies are so dang cute, we want to avoid doing this adorable thing to their belly because I see them as a cat behavior consultant a year later for attacking the client's hand and the clients don't like that. But unfortunately, they taught the cat to attack their hand because this is a fun toy. So when it comes to play, I know it sounds silly, but there's specific ways to play with your cat. I'm a big fan of wand toys because when we're playing with our cats, we are simulating their prey behavior cycle. The staring at the prey, stalking, chasing, pouncing, and killing. We don't want them to be doing that to us. Um, so I really, and let's say you were playing with a wand toy with your cat and passing it over your feet, but not realizing it, because a lot of my clients do that, which is why recording things is awesome. Your cat, we just taught your cat to attack your feet. So having a long wand toy, the toy is the prey, the caregiver is over here, it's a safe distance, this is great. We want to simulate the prey with the toy. So cats don't catch mice and birds. They don't, mice and birds don't just fly right in front of their face. Um, but a lot of the times, this is what we do when we're playing with a wand toy. Um, so it's really important to move it similar to prey. Um, like, for example, I'm sure your cat loves when you hide it behind a couch and it pops out with the bird. It's flying, it's flying. And it's really important to wind down play. So instead of just taking that wand toy away, we want to wind it down. Because you can imagine how frustrating that is. They're in the middle of a hunt and the toy just goes away. Um, so as the scheduled playtime or the playtime is winding down, I'm going to start maybe if I have the bird, the bird is going to kind of start flapping and slowing down. And then if the kitten pounces on it, I'm going to gently drop it and then give the cat a treat. Because what do cats do at the end of their kill? They eat. Um, so it's really important to wind down that playtime. Also, reward polite requests for play. We want to reward behaviors we want, right? So we don't want the cat jumping out from under our bed and pouncing on us. That's not fun. But we do want a reward when they bring a toy to us. We want to play with them. We want to play fetch or a wand toy. Or your cat might run up to you and start going like this and being really playful, like rolling around. That's them asking to play. Some cats actually bring wand toys to their caregivers. Please reinforce, reward them asking nicely for play and play with them. And then just a few things on what you shouldn't do during play. We don't wanna to touch or pet your cat when you're playing with them. Like I mentioned, we're simulating the prey behavior cycle and that's like your cat getting a mouse outside and you hugging them in, in the middle of it. They may redirect and bite or scratch you and that's appropriate behavior. So when we're playing with our kitties, that's not when we touch and pet our cats. We, we're gonna avoid playing with our hands and feet we're not gonna play with hoodies, uh, hoodie strings, or things like dangle obje objects, because we don't want to teach them. Running up and attacking things that are moving on a human is a good idea. We're not gonna wrestle with our cats, even though I know it can be fun, but I can't tell you how many cats I see where clients rough play with their cats and then it becomes something else. Um, tease a cat with a toy, but never let him catch it. So when it comes to simulating that prey, we need to allow them to catch it. Um, if you're playing with a laser toy, they're not my favorite. And the reason why is they don't get to catch anything. Can you imagine how much frustration that causes? So if your cat does love lasers, we're definitely going to mix it up and allow them to play with other toys. But if they catch the dot, we're going to throw them a catnip kicker or a treat, something to get. Um, we're not going to lift the cat off the ground as they're biting the toy. Or again, we're not gonna hit the cat with the toy or swing it right in front of their face. And sometimes, especially with fearful or conflicted cats, if they're just staring at the toy, that's the first part of the prey behavior cycle. A lot of people are like, the cat doesn't like the toy. The fearful cat, ask, asking them to come out in front of you is a lot. 
um, and then actively move in front of you. So if the kit, the cat or the kitten is just watching the toy, they're still playing. So still slow it down and toss a treat. So again, try to avoid abruptly ending that play session. And then carriers and travel, we want cats to love their carriers. And when they're kittens, this is the best time to do this. So you're gonna get your awesome carrier, you're gonna integrate it into your home. So what I mean by that in an area you tend to be. So not that basement closet that's open, that's so far away. It's gonna be in your living room or your bedroom. You're gonna place really good stuff in it like catnip, silver vine, place familiar soft bedding. When the kitten goes in there, reinforce them. You can even play with them around it, give them treats when they go in it. And a lot of cats, I do this before all my kitten kindergarten classes and they love the carrier. And then when it comes to the car, I'm gonna close the carrier and I'm gonna carry it like this from the bottom because cats don't like roller coaster rides. Um, so I'm gonna carry the carrier out to the car. I'm not gonna start the car, we're just gonna get some treats. We're gonna go back inside. Then I might take the carrier into the car, start the car. We're gonna maybe get some treats in the carrier, maybe play throughout the carrier with the wand toy. And then we go inside. Then I might take a drive around the block. So again, it's that breaking it down into small steps for the kitten. And most cats, we're gonna just pair it with good stuff and then they love their carrier and they like traveling because our cats need to move and go places. So it makes it better when they don't hate the car. So to kind of sum up everything we talked about, when it comes to socialization at home, in some cases you can just wear a mask during what your cat's already doing and some of the things we already talked about, but Set up the environment to be successful for your kitty. Um, so if I'm gonna give my cat a new substrate, if I'm gonna be like, walk on, um, for example, go in the bathtub. Sometimes I'll start the water just a bit and put ping pong balls, cause it's fun. I'm gonna have all that ready before the kitten comes in. I'm not gonna run the water while the kitten's in there. So I set up the environment. I'm gonna start small and work up based on how that cat kitten is working and interacting and showing me. I'm gonna do one thing at a time. I'm not gonna be like, different substrate, different noise, and I'm gonna handle you, because uh, that's just too much at a time. I'm gonna pair it with stuff the kitten likes. Christy mentioned it's really important to find reinforcers they like. We're gonna reward them for interacting with any new or novel things. We're gonna assess their body language throughout and make sure that they're below threshold and keep it fun. And that kitten makes me happy. So last to not least, or but not least is, me and Kristen are gonna just talk about two cats, some cats we've worked with who've had socialization appropriately and success stories. So this is Valor. He is an amazing therapy blind cat. So he was a kitten and unfortunately had some pretty severe eye issues and it was best for him, his eyes were removed. Um, and he started going to the vet. His owner worked on wonderful socialization, getting him used to the car, getting him used to restraints. And we work together to get him used to touch because he's blind. So obviously things can startle him very quickly. So for example, my client says pick up before she picks him up. She says pets before she touches him. So do all of the therapy people that work with the cat. Because again, it's a lot less startling. But this set this cat up for success. And now he's a therapy cat, not only to his mother's cats, who she fosters throughout. He helps to foster a lot of kittens. He helps in my kitten kindergarten classes. He's the well-socialized adult cat that kind of hangs out, or I might walk him through as I'm assessing the kitten's body language. And again, he's a well-socialized cat, so he's not lunging at them. He's showing positive body language, and he's helping. He goes to senior homes and makes people's lives better. And all of that was because his mother set him up for success and socialized him to all the things. And you can follow him on Instagram because he's adorable. And then this is Megan and Mittens. So these were two kittens that they were fostering and they went above and beyond and brought them to my kitten kindergarten class. They were fearful, kind of flighty and conflicted. They were about 11 weeks, so a little older when the client, the fosters first got them. And at the first class, we, they were really into checking out the new, new things, playing with each other, but the other humans, little too much. Um, and as you can see, we were working on holding them, pairing it with good stuff, showing them different types of substrates, exposing them to different humans and kittens, 
and cats. And then I also have toddlers that come to my kitten kindergarten class because everyone's going to have kids. Um, and within a short period of time, by the third class, they were the most outgoing kittens. And they were adopted together shortly after that. And they still are happy in their homes. So I really think the kitten socialization set them up for success to be adopted. And you saw such a change from these conflicted, unsure, flighty, kind of like, oh, cats to, I want to play. I'm the first one out. I want to check out that cool new thing. All right. Um, so I had two, two little stories I wanted to share as well. I know we're almost out of time and I see a bunch of really good questions. So I'm going to go kind of fast, but I'll definitely stick around a little after um, 6.30 6 our time, 9.30 your time. Um, so I'll stick around and maybe Tabitha can as well, um, but I'll just go through these real fast. Um, so one of the stories I wanted to tell was about the ferals. And these were a group of cats that lived outside one of the first apartments I lived in back in Ohio. And Mama's was a, um, ooh. Mama's was a cat, oh no, what happened there? Um, that um, was very unsocialized. And she had this litter of kittens and she wouldn't let us near any of the kittens. We, we weren't allowed to touch them or anything like that. And I had decided that I wanted to get them spayed and neutered, get them ear tipped and everything and um, get them all their shots. But because they were feral, I couldn't very well just like pick them up and do that. And I also didn't want them to be super terrified when they eventually did go to the vet. So um, I did want to try to get them used to people. So once the kittens were weaned, the mother was a little more tolerant of them coming out. Um, and so I started to feed them. And at first, I would just talk to them through the window. So I'd basically give them their food. They wouldn't come out until I went into the house. And then they would start eating. And then I talked to them. So um, the idea here is that I'm kind of letting them see that when they're eating and there's something good happening, they're also hearing a human voice and it's not something threatening. Um, and then eventually I would kind of stand at the door with the door just slightly open and talk to them. Again, not being threatening, not imposing myself on them, but just pairing my voice, my presence with the food. And by allowing this passive presence, eventually I could sit outside and they could approach me. They still didn't want pet, they still didn't want cuddled, but their fear response definitely did decline um, compared to what it started as. So even with some of these cats that are under socialized, I really suggest keep going with it, keep trying, it's worth the time. And um, I don't know if it, in the end, was less scary or more scary um, to go to the vet, but I'd like to think that it did help them. And um, I'm not going to talk too much about this because Tabitha did a really great job talking about desensitization already. But I wanted to just mention my cat, Kevin, who is kind of afraid of shoes, and we've been working to desensitize him to shoes. Um, but again, the whole idea is that we're gradually increasing the exposure to that item. So at first, I might put my shoes on and walk a step, and then I toss the treat, have him come a little closer, I get a little closer, um, but I'm not going to just walk in with my shoes, walk all around him, pick him up, you know, flood him with all the stuff. I'm going to slowly work up to it, and I think he's getting better. Um, we're, we're still in the... Um, the de desensitization phase, um, but I do think that he's getting there. And just an example of even though he had really amazing socialization, he, um, you can see on the left there, he went to Oregon State and did training. He was actually in a documentary, you can see there on the right, but he still is afraid of things. So um, really you might have to keep trying their whole lives and addressing some of these issues as they get older, but it can be done. So that's all uh, we have. Um, you can see, I don't know what is on the screen right now, some marking or something, but um, hopefully you can still read our websites and uh, social media. And I do see several good questions. So I don't know if Tabitha wants to come back. Um, I can say uh, one question was, if kittens prefer social stimuli, would they feel more rewarded by petting them than with treats in a training session? 
And I will say for some cats, yes, absolutely. Um, we actually, the whole reason we ran that preference assessment at Oregon State was because we found when cats were coming into the lab, they weren't eating. We'd put the treat in front of them and they'd just turn up their nose. But then once we were petting them or playing with them instead, we saw a rapid increase in the number of cats that were able to be trained. So I would say that for some cats, just petting or praising them alone can be enough uh, during training. And I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Tabitha. Oh, no, I definitely agree. I, reinforcers can be so many different things, food, praise, um, petting, play. It's just we tend to go to food since that's a more simple, like right to the point. Because when it comes to petting is what type of petting, how long that petting. So those are more individual preferences. But like Kristen said, figure out what your kitten likes. You guys know what your cats like. Figure out what your kittens love and use that as a reinforcer for sure. Mm -hmm. Do you want to comment on the desensitization to restraint? Oh, sure. So I would do desensitization and counter conditioning to restraint. It depends. So first, first things first, we identify the specific trigger because some cats aren't big fans of scruffing, but most cats aren't big fans of scruffing. And that's a whole nother lecture. Um, but that's how many of us, including myself as a veterinary technician, was taught to restrain cats. Um, and understandably, it's very conflicting. They can't escape. So I know why they don't like it very much. So if it was scruffing, I would work towards, oh, what if I just placed something in front of them and tried that instead and just did their vaccine while they were standing up and eating. Um, I vaccinate a lot of cats while they're playing or, or eating off a licky mat. Um, I, don't, I haven't scruffed a cat in over eight years and I work with the most fearful of fearful kitties. But again, that's a whole nother lecture. So it depends what, that's a more complex behavior question. Um, but usually what we do is we figure out the specific triggers because some cats, it's their ears because they've had ear infections in the past. Some cats, it's their lower back because they have arthritis or they've just had weird learning history that may cause some conflict there. Some cats, it may be scruffing. Um, so first things first, we'd figure out what exactly their triggers are. And then we would create a plan breaking it down into small steps, similar how I did to that kitten, where I was like, we're going to start with one pet, one pet, and then we're going to work up to six to seven pets because I want to set that cat up for success. And humans like to pet cats like this. Um, so that's a more complex question. And I would be happy to talk to you more through email. Um, but usually we identify their triggers. We find good things they like. We create a hierarchy of where their lowest non-stressful point was. So for example, if the cat's okay with this, okay, we're gonna start here. And then I might work up, like I might hold a cat like this just subtly with my, my hand over their shoulders. Um, and we would work up to getting them more comfortable with those next steps. That's a hard question to ask to answer without more information, but great question. <laughs> Yeah, there's um, another question. How old are the kittens in socialization class and how do you prevent incidents, leash, and training? Um, so I think our answers might be slightly different. Uh, for the classes that we're running, they're for older kittens, so three to eight months. And we do that even though that's outside of that sensitive um, period of time. Most people are not adopting their cats until they're of that age. And so we wanted to see, okay, what's the impact then of going through this class as an older adult? So we're focused on three to eight months. Um, as far as preventing incidents, um, we, I can say, have never had an incident out of 50 kittens that have participated. Um, there was only one time where we had a cat that was unhandleable um, in that even the owner didn't feel comfortable like handling the cat. They didn't bring the cat in a carrier. Um, there was a whole host of issues, but that was the only cat that um, we had to ask to leave. Um, and I think it's because we, we space the cats out so we don't throw everyone together in one small room to begin with. Everybody's spaced out, everybody gets comfortable over time. So the first time, you know, they're just getting used to the room, looking around. They might not even come out of the carrier the first day. 
And then the second day, we're slowly working up to them, exploring more of the room, exploring the cats, exploring the people. So I think that's part of it, that we're gradually getting them used to it. Um, they do wear harness and leash during the class. Um, there are times where we might take the harness and leash off if they're doing a trick or something. But even then, we, we always have the owner, we have myself, we have my teaching assistant. There's several people watching. So um, it's unlikely the cat's just going to get the chance to bolt and attack another cat. Um, but yeah, we haven't had an issue. I don't know if Tabitha wants to comment more on her classes. Yeah, so I do kittens from seven to 16 weeks. 16 weeks is 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 can be harder. I expect those cats to be a little more conflicted. Like that first class, they may just stay in their carrier and that's okay. Because again, we've talked about how important controlled environments are. And that's how me and Christian, Kristen do our kitten kindergarten classes. So we haven't had, I haven't had any incidences, but I have separate, similar to her, I have stations. So I have a handling station, a play station with a lot of different um, textures and things to walk on and toys and hiding places. And then we have another one, but we have pens throughout. All the kittens were kit carrier trained prior to going into the class. Um, so we don't necessarily just let all the cats hang out and see each other because that would be more flooding um, where like I may miss something while I'm talking over here and that cat might scare that other cat and whoa, we just made a negative association for that kitten. So everything's really controlled and structured and we use X pens and play pens um, along with carriers as well as harnesses to keep the cats safe distance. But we also have the cats interact with each other, but similar to Kristen's classes, it's me and a lot of associates that I have and colleagues who are very familiar with feline body language and we're watching the kittens and taking them out of situations where if they are showing some signs of stress or fear, we will lure them away or take a treat away or take a, a wand toy to lure them away to get them out of that situation. So due to the controlled environment and keeping it positive, we haven't had any issues. Yeah, and I, I love all that. It's very similar to what we do. And I will say too, um, we have like cat towers and stuff as well. So I think that helps too, because not only it's a big room, but there's vertical space too. So cats can just kind of go where they feel comfortable. Some cats just want to be up on the tower watching and that's about it. So I think varying like the levels and all that kind of stuff helps as well. And my cat Macy is trying to get involved if you can't tell. Uh, <laughs> so much. <laughs> oh goodness. Um, there's another question on separation anxiety, which is really good because right now with COVID, we're at home all the time. And so especially for kittens, we're kind of teaching them that like this is the normal. So then when you go back to work eventually, it's going to be like, what happened? Um, so I think that's a great idea what you suggest about leaving the kittens alone for periods of time. Um, just to show them that's normal and maybe that means that you just go out in the yard for a little bit or while you're going to the store, things like that. Um, but even in cats, separation anxiety is kind of controversial. Um, uh, attachment is something that I study and so we have found that cats can form attachments and therefore should be able to form separation anxiety. But I do know it's a little bit of a controversial subject, but I would go ahead and safeguard against it like you're saying anyway. Yeah, I totally agree. I do see separation. I see behaviors that could that could be representative of separation distress. As Kristen said, thankfully, I think there's actually a new study out that I haven't read yet about it. Um, but it is controversial. I do hear from some people who who say it's not a thing. I feel it is. Um, the red flags in cats are different than dogs. Um, cause even with dogs, clients don't notice, not maliciously, but cause they're not home and then they come home and there's defecation and then there is things that are torn up or broken or ripped. Cats tend not to destroy things. So I think it's harder, which is another reason why I think it's controversial. I think it's harder for caregivers to recognize that their cats may have some anxiety related to them being away. Um, but I definitely feel like it's, it, it could be a thing. Uh, I'm a big fan of recording, which a lot of us are being home more often, but I always have my clients record when they aren't present 
so I can observe the kitten's body language because they're going to tell me if they're stressed because some kittens might just be bored. It's the same thing with puppies. So we definitely like to get more information, but I do think that those are really great exercises. Like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to hide some treats because we really didn't have a chance to talk about puzzle toys, but I'm going to hide treats throughout the house. And then I'm going to go for a nice walk to get some fresh air for an hour. Um, because I don't want to be home all the time. And I want my cats to understand that I'm not going to be home. And not only am I not going to be home, but cool things happen when I'm not going to be home. So th those are definitely things you guys can all start to work on right now. And I definitely think that's really important. Can you um, share some of the treats that you like for cats? My favorite is churro. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <yeah. laughs> I actually have a, I have a reinforcer handout that I would be happy to share with everybody. I created it because I often get asked that question or I'll go to a veterinary hospital and they're like, the cats don't eat anything. And I'm like, you're giving that you have two options. This is crazy. <laughs> Kristen likes different things than I do. Um, but my favorite things honestly are, are lickable treats. Um, I think cats like them better because they're more smelly and disgusting. The more smellier, the better. So I'm a big fan of churro. I love whipped cream, uh, squeezed cheese. And all of these, of course, are in moderation. Um, and then I really do like the Fancy Feast, those fish fillets that can rip apart. Those are probably my go-to for four, but I have so many others. What are your favorites? Yeah, um, well, yeah, any like of the pate paste stuff they love. Um, we even have used uh, baby food, like human baby food. Oh, yeah, baby food's a great one. Since yeah. Since came out, I'm like, it's, it's, been, it's been awesome because chicken and turkey baby food without onions or garlic, of course. Um, and then you could even use the baby food cap as a clicker for really fearful cats. That's really smart. It's much a dampened sound, yeah. Yeah, so we use a lot of baby food, no spices or anything in that. Um, and then from our preference study, we found that the most preferred food of the majority of cats is tuna. So again, you want it to be in moderation, but a little bit of tuna, a little bit of cooked chicken as well, they love. Um, sometimes I'll even just like cook some chicken and add water to it and then have like broth. And then I'll like have a bowl of broth, I'll have them sit let them lick a few, take it away, you know, keep doing it that way. So you can kind of get creative as well. So um, that might be it. There were a few others, but I know that we're running out of time. Do you want to address any of these other ones, Tabitha? Let me quickly look. Um, And I do see the question about the podcast. Um, so yeah, that was Cat Side Podcast, if you're interested in checking that out. Tabitha is going to be on an upcoming episode. So if you want to hear more from us. Podcast, nerd out with science and cats with us. Um, <laughs> like all of you are. How did I, I'll get this last question. Because um, some of these questions are more complex. So unfortunately, when it comes to my cat's attacking my cat, or my cat is peeing outside the box, or I want my cat to love handling those are a lot more complex and specific, so they can be really difficult to answer without getting more information. Um, but I saw Kathy mentioned, how do you discourage kittens from climbing your leg and biting your feet? So I'll be honest, as a consultant, that's something I commonly see in cats who don't have enough enrichment because many cats, if we don't give them opportunities to predatory outlets, so like food puzzle toys where they work for their food, scheduled play times where they can attack and do these beautiful motions with all their muscles, they'll find things to pounce. And it might be your foot uh, or your leg. So when it comes to discouraging kittens from climbing, first things first, increase enrichment, increase predatory outlets overall for that cat. And another thing is like, let's say it happens in the same place all the time because for, I see a lot of clients who are like, it's when I go in the hallway past this bedroom as management, what you could start doing is have a, have a basket of toys at the top of your stairs and maybe toss a toy that, with the sound that your cat likes ahead of you before you walk past because you're giving that cat 
an alternative behavior. So, hey, I want you to pounce and attack things because like that's normal cat behavior, but I don't want you to attack my leg. And it's way easier to redirect you before you actually do it. And that, and as a human, you're like, I see this so everyone can be consistent to redirect that kitten to help break up that behavior while you're working on increasing enrichment. And also verifying to people that we're not dragging wand toys over, over our feet. Um, Cause again, that's something I've even done by accident. This is why you record yourself. Um, avoid play with hands and feet. But I think redirecting that cat um, is really helpful and increasing enrichment are probably my two main things. And if the cat is actively biting you, um, I, ideally that's not, we don't want that to happen, but I would freeze, um, remain still, which may be hard because instinctually you're going to want to go, -da -da -da, which makes you sound like super fun prey. Um, and actually makes the cat more engaged. So even though it may be hard, we want to avoid doing that. And we want to remain still and then toss a treat or a toy um, away from you to redirect them. And again, you're not reinforcing them biting your foot, you're reinforcing them for disengaging. And in the moment, we just want them, because if you yell or hit them or push them off, that's just going to amp them up more. Um, so those are just a few tips that I would recommend for that. Hey, Kristen. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so um, yeah, thanks everybody for joining us. This was a lot of fun and uh, hopefully you enjoyed it as well. Definitely check us out online on social media, contact us if there's more questions. And um, also this video will be posted I, uh, definitely on my YouTube. I don't know if Tabitha is gonna post it anywhere, but if you wanna go back and look at any of the information, um, just check out uh, any of these links and it'll be posted. So thank awesome. you very much. Thank you everybody for spending your Friday night and afternoon with us. <laughs> and um, stay safe and stay healthy and um, maybe we'll see you again soon. Bye guys. Bye.